Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the Krasno Global Event Series at UNC Chapel Hill. Thank you for joining us today. Today, our event comes to you from the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Our distinguished guest today is General Philip Breedlove, NATO's former Supreme Allied Commander Europe. I will introduce him to you in a minute. I'm Klaus Laris, and I'm the Richard M. Krasno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. At present, I'm a Global Europe and Kissinger China Institute Fellow here at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. We are still grappling with the terrible and brutal wars in Ukraine and Israel and Gaza. Military victory is not assured. But what actually is victory? What does victory mean for Ukraine, for Israel, for the US, and for the rest of the world, such as the many people in the so-called global south? It seems that we all have different notions of what victory should look like and what victory is. General Breedlove will help us to understand what is going on. We will discuss the military strategies of both sides in the Ukraine war and the war in the Middle East, and explore the different meaning of victory uh, for all sides. General Philip Breedlove is one of America's most prominent and well-known military officers. He has had many distinguished and influential positions in the US military. Four-star General Philip Breedlove was NATO's former Supreme Allied Commander Europe, SECUR, and he also was commander of the US European Command. Previously, General Breedlove was command of U.S. Air Forces Europe and U.S. Air Forces Africa. He also was the 36th Vice Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force. General Breedlove has had many and numerous other operational command and staff positions, too many to mention them all, and he has completed nine overseas tours. He also was responsible for Air Force's activities conducted through 3rd Air Force in an area of operation covering more than 19 million square miles. And this area included 105 countries in Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. General Breedlove has flown combat missions, combat missions in Operation Joint Forge and Joint Guardian. This was uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina and over Kosovo. Phil Breedlove is a command pilot with 3,500 flying hours, primarily in the F-16, the plane so much in demand in Ukraine today. Before I pepper General Breedlove with lots of questions, let me just point out that as always, we are videotaping the event today for our famous YouTube channel. And as you know, all the videos of all our events can be watched on our YouTube channel. The address is youtube.com slash Krasno UNC. We have a great international Zoom audience today, and everyone is most welcome to submit your questions to our speaker today by making use of the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our two Krasno assistants today, Emma and Jerry, will select your questions and read them out aloud to all of us. General Breedlove, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Krasno Global Event Series. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you for having me. And I'm under a little pressure here as I see one of the professors from Georgia Tech who I respect so much is here to grade my paper. Dr. Birchfeld, thanks for attending. <laughs> this is good that you remember your professor very well. Um, General Breedlev, what is going on in Ukraine? What is the military situation right now at the moment? <laughs> Well, of course, we are entering into uh, the sort of winter period, a period of first mud and then of hard freeze and a very challenging winter for those forces on the ground as it was last winter uh, is what is expected. Um, we see uh, the Russians in uh, attempting an offensive in the vicinity of Avdika. It's primarily a very uh, foot soldier intensive uh, uh, operation, very little huge movements by armored formations. And then in the South, we see that um, that Ukraine is on the offensive, has gone across the river onto the eastern side of the river, which they call the left bank, as you know. And so there are uh, multiple pretty tough operations going on. But 
the fighting in general will slow down across the next several weeks on the land, most probably. But what we see is uh, continuing strikes via the air, both by Russia and Ukraine against the enemy. Uh, and we see uh, Ukraine engaged in a very successful uh, battle of denial in the northern Black Sea, whereby they have sunk or damaged quite a few of the Black Sea fleet and forced the Black Sea fleet to move back. So uh, basically uh, a period of uh, not large land movements for a while, but a lot of infantry type fighting going on, a continued pressure on the Russian fleet in the Black Sea, continued pressure by both sides via the air, primarily by drones and long range missiles. And that's where we will be for uh, some time to come. When I read the media in the last few weeks, and it always was reported that Ukraine's counteroffensive did not really succeed, that we invested a lot of hope into that counteroffensive. And of course, Ukraine itself did. But in the end, it didn't really um, lead to a breakthrough, that there's a, st a stalemate and a war of attrition going on, and no side is winning. Would that be your judgment as well, or do you think differently? No, I don't accept a lot of the words you use, stalemates and things like that. I, I don't think any of those are appropriate. I think that there are people who had their vision of what this, this counteroffensive would be, and that those that really do not understand maneuver warfare or this particular war, they had this vision of rapiers in the air and flags in the breeze and this rapidly advancing force, and that would be what would be expected of this counteroffensive. None of us expected that, and many of us expected a lot of what you see now. But uh, what we have seen is a steady pressure, and while not monumental, but steady gains in the South, whereby uh, um, Ukraine is making some progress. Uh, we think that they are pushing very hard to be able to control, if not cut, the land bridge in the south, and getting across the river was important to that, as well as making their advances in the south, whereby they could bring long-range artillery to bear on the land bridge and, and cause disruption of the supply to Crimea. So, um, yes, the world really wanted to see more advance. Uh, most people didn't expect what the world wants to see, rather something similar to what we are seeing. And because neither side, neither side has been able to establish battlefield air superiority over their troops, this war has devolved into a fairly artillery intensive war of attrition in the South, which, which needs to be won. So if, uh, if you explain that in, in layman's words to a layman audience, who is actually winning right now? Is Ukraine winning indeed or are they not? Neither side is truly, quote unquote, winning right now. Uh, Russia is, is uh, suffering more casualties, but they have more men to throw at it. And they've reasserted themselves by using prisoners again and bringing some fairly untrained troops to the fight, and they are taking quite a lot of uh, losses down there. But Ukraine, which can't afford to lose as much as the Russians, is are also losing uh, a fair number of troops. So right now, winning is not a word I would use for either side, but I don't think it's a stalemate. In Evdika, it's it's very dynamic. And in certain portions of the South, it's very dynamic. Um, and then it, it will sort itself out as we approach spring. So if Ukraine is losing an awful lot of troops as well, both women, uh, both men and women uh, at the moment, uh, isn't the situation more difficult for Ukraine than for Russia? Because as you said, the Russians can uh, have more and more manpower to fall uh, back on. <laughs> So I would just rephrase what you said a little bit by saying a longer war is going to favor Russia because it has a deeper bench of people and equipment. And that's why it's important, important across the next months 
that the West, and I would say the West led by the United States, needs to make some very different policy decisions than it has made so far. And it needs to make those decisions to allow Ukraine to have what it needs to win vice what we're giving them now, which I believe is defined as we're giving them enough to not be defeated, but certainly not enough to win on the battlefield. So you say more weapons, more ammunition is necessary. The very first thing that is necessary has nothing to do with weapons. It has everything to do with policy. Right now, the West, led by America, does not have a policy for victory for Ukraine. It is my opinion, and we can delve into this in the questions further, that we have taken counsel of our fears in the West. We are deterred. We do not know how to handle a defeat of Russia and Putin. We don't know what that looks like. So right now we are merely trying to move towards a negotiated peace as opposed to a victory for Ukraine. So if uh, Joe Biden asked you to come to the White House and advise him on what to do precisely, what would you tell him what to do? Adopt a policy. So our policy right now is captured in two statements that has been used over and over in this war. We, from our president down through the ranks, we've heard the following things. We're gonna be there for as long as it takes, and we're gonna give them everything they need. To a military man, neither of those is a complete sentence. We're gonna be there as long as it takes to hold a birthday party, to cross the river, to, to recapture a small town in the north, or will we be there until all of Russian forces are defeated and expelled from Ukraine. And we say that we're gonna give them everything they need. Once again, to do what? Hold a birthday party, to cross the river. The sentence is incomplete until we define what the objective of the sentence is. The, the Ukrainian people have stated that their objective is to expel, to defeat and expel all Russian forces from all of Ukraine, and that includes the Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea, the Ukrainian peninsula of, of Crimea. And so I think uh, to your question, yes, there's lots of things they need, but the very first thing they need is a policy by the West, which says what our efforts are there for. And um, you believe that victory with sufficient Western support is possible. Absolutely. Here's what we know. So if you remember the first part of the war, after Russia came crashing through and grabbed up over 45 to 50% of the landmass of Ukraine in those first four days, what happened? Ukraine strategically defeated Russia in the north of Kiev. Then, uh, several weeks to a month later, Ukraine strategically defeated Russian forces on the north and northwest side of Kharkiv. And I would offer that in the south now, Ukraine is moving towards an operational, not a strategic, but an operational defeat of Russia in the south in the spring, possibly. So what we know is that when a well-provided Ukrainian force meets a Russian force in the field, the Ukrainian forces win. So I see three possible outcomes for this war. If the West diminishes its supply to uh, Ukraine, or if they stop aiding Ukraine, Ukraine will fall and be subjugated by Russia and become a part of the Russian empire again. As you and I just discussed a few minutes ago, if, we make no change to our current provision of the Ukrainians, meaning we do the same thing we're doing now, which is giving them enough to remain viable on the battlefield, but not, not giving them what they need to win, then eventually Ukraine will lose because Russia has more depth of men and more depth of equipment, and eventually the West will tire of spending money and sending aid to Ukraine. So if we don't change what we're doing now, I believe Ukraine also 
loses in the end game. But if we in the West decide that we are going to provision Ukraine to win this war, and we can talk about that in the questions, what that means. If we provision Ukraine to win this war, Ukraine will win the war and they will expel Russia. And then if we're academically honest, then we'll have to deal with a defeated Russia and a defeated Putin. And this is what the West is afraid of. The West is deterred. It has taken counsel of its fears and does not want to even think about what it means to defeat Russia and defeat Putin. And so that third decision is the one that's the most important. Do we help Ukraine to reestablish sovereign control of its sovereign land, including the sovereign Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea? So winning for Ukraine and for the West means to push out all Russian troops out of uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, including Crimea. Well, no. I don't agree with what you just said. I think what you just said is what Ukraine defines winning as. Yeah. We in the West have not adopted that as our vision of winning. I actually believe that most Western capitals now simply want the Ukrainians to go to the table, give Russia more land, and uh, then we can find a peace, quote unquote. I, I would go remind ourselves of history. In 2008, uh, Russia, and, and we all know that the beginning of that war, there were lots of reasons for the beginning of that war. But the end result was a superpower amassed its land army, marched across an internationally recognized border, and subjugated and to continues today to uh, uh, occupy and hold 20% of the nation of Georgia. Then in 2014, Russia again amassed its army, invaded Ukraine twice, and occupies and holds now Crimea and portions of the Donbass and the coastline, which are so important, controlling two of the owning, capturing two of the most important uh, ports and being able to control the third port from Crimea. So uh, uh, about 13% of of Ukraine was subjugated in 2014. And now we here we are again in 2022 and 2023, and there are already voices talking about we need to get to the table and figure out how much more Ukrainian territory we need to give Russia for a peace. And once again, as we did in 08, we rewarded bad behavior. In 14, we rewarded bad behavior and now we are beginning to look like we're going to reward bad behavior for a third time by giving Russia more land for peace. And I would offer to you having raised children that if you reward bad behavior, reward bad behavior and reward bad behavior, you're not gonna get good behavior. You're gonna get more bad behavior. And so we have decisions to make about that. Would a victory for Ukraine be possible without recapturing back uh, Crimea? Uh, most of the very serious thinkers about this, Ben Hodges being one of the best at understanding exactly how this works. Uh, I agree with him, and I have said more than uh, more often than not that the most important terrain in this war is Crimea. And here's why I believe that way. Currently, uh, Russia controls or occupies two, you know, Ukraine has a lot of little smaller ports, but there are essentially three major ports, ports that are extremely important to the, the economy. Mariupol, which was destroyed early in the war and Russia now holds Mariupol. That was their port for export of agriculture, grain, et cetera. Very important to the economy of Ukraine, very important to the, to the uh, hungry mouths in the Middle, East, the Middle East, North Africa, et cetera. So Mariupol fell. Sevastopol fell when they took Crimea. This is typically the military port for the Ukrainian fleet. And from Crimea, 
and Sevastopol, Russia can control Odessa, which back before the invasion was the port more for durable goods that came out of uh, Ukraine. So all three in that port can be completely controlled from the Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea, which is occupied now by Russians. And so at this point, two of three of the most important ports to Ukraine are held by Russia. And Russia demonstrated during the grain embargo that they can control the port of Odessa from the Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea. And so uh, right now, uh, the economy of Ukraine will never recover if Russia continues to hold Mariupol, Crimea, and can dominate Odessa from Crimea. So I, a long, long, long answer to say, I agree with many, many military thinkers that we will never get the long-term worldwide investment in Ukraine as long as Russia completely controls the flow of goods out of all of the major ports of Ukraine. Thank you. Do you think the current problems of supporting Ukraine sufficiently is a problem which is really uh, rooted in the White House or more in the uh, American Congress? Okay, well, I don't like to do politics. Let me say that the problem of support to Ukraine is, as I said before, lies in the hands of Western policy leaders. Certainly the United States is one of those Western policy leaders. There are other large nations in Europe that are a part of that leadership as well. Those leaders to include the United States and most probably would need to be led by the United States, they are the ones that have to make a decision to do something different than we're doing now. Simply supply, supplying Ukraine with enough to remain viable on the battlefield is not going to win this war. At some point, Western leadership, I believe it has to start in the United States, has to say, we are going to give Ukraine what it needs uh, to, to win this war. I think you know that in America, in our Congress, we've got a big middle that supports Ukraine. And we've got fringes on the left and fringes on the right that do not support Ukraine. That's problematic, mm -hmm. but that is that is the fact. When you look at the European countries, are you um, disappointed that they are not doing more or are you pleased that they're doing as much as they do? Because initially there was seemed to be much greater hesitation than there is uh, now. That's correct. It was a slow start for our Euro European brothers and sisters. There's actually two lists out there. I'll use the least dramatic. But if you look at the list of nations and what they're giving <clears throat> on a per GDP basis, on a per GDP basis, the United States is 12th on that list. 11 nations give more on a per GDP basis than the United States does. There's another list of the same, and I don't know how this works out, but it's 14th on that list. So let's just say if it's 12, 11 nations in NATO are already on a GDP basis giving more than the United States of America is. And I think that's important to note. There are a lot of nations that are hurting more by what they give. Additionally, the numbers I've seen, the same reports, show that essentially now all of Europe gives almost exactly the same as the United States does. So we have come a long way. How much Europe supports this war has come a long way, and it is owned or felt to be owned by a lot more of our NATO allies. You feel that the American public doesn't realize how important Ukraine is for the United States and the Western world. Should more be done to explain things? Yes, absolutely yes. I, I hold our current administration responsible for this. Um, uh, you know, the standard couple from the Middle West of the United States, 
uh, I believe they absolutely don't believe in bullies and they don't like the fact that Russia is running over their neighbors, but they do not understand Ukraine. And sadly, a lot of Americans think of Ukraine's as a bunch of corrupt, drunken Cossacks. And they are so far from that. This is a highly technical nation. This is a nation that built the rocket motors that America flew into faith, to space on for decades. <clears throat> this is a nation that still builds some of the best aircraft engines in the world. And frankly, the Chinese want motor siege in a huge way and have been trying to buy it for some time because they cannot build engines as well as the Ukrainians. And so very few people understand how much grain Ukraine exports and how important that grain is to the rest of the world. We got a glimpse of it when Russia cut it off and started to blockade uh, um, um, Odessa and the prices even in America started going up. So very few Americans actually understand how important Ukraine is to Europe and then how important Europe is to the United States of America. And I, I think that our leadership needs to do a better job of explaining these facts to Americans. Thank you. The Russian military was perhaps overemphasized or our expectation of the quality of the Russian military may have been greater than that turned out to be. But Russia's military is not a paper tiger. How would you evaluate their strengths and weaknesses? So, so what we see is Russia's strengths are in the things that we saw Russia's strengths in World War II, and they really, those sort of leanings haven't changed much. Their strengths are in the mass that they bring to the battlefield in armored vehicles and in men and the, the deep uh, uh, well of more men and vehicles that they can bring to the battlefield. We see them being exceptional in a few of the new warfare ways. For instance, Russia is really doing a good job of electronic warfare on the battlefield. And we are learning from them and we are learning how to defeat them in the electronic warfare battlefield. But places where we expected Russia to be strong, they have proven not to be strong. They have one of the largest uh, air forces in the world, and one of supposedly they brag about and talk about a very sophisticated and highly technical air force. It has proven completely unable of doing some of the modern uh, missions that air forces have to do, like suppression of enemy air defenses. We call it SEED. They have failed at SEED, and therefore they have failed to establish what we would call battlefield air superiority over their troops. And so the Air Force, while it may not, it may do doctrinally function the way ours does, and therefore it wouldn't be exactly correct to do a side-by-side -side comparison. But what we see is the Air Force has been unable to affect the battlefield in a large way, the way that Western Air Forces believe they have to. And then again, we see a pretty large North Sea fleet. There is no Ukrainian fleet, and yet Ukraine has dealt dozens of losses to the, to the Russians, either by serious damage or sinking their ships, so badly that they're withdrawing some of their ships from Sevastopol and moving them to the eastern shores of the Black Sea. And in, you probably read in the papers this week, they're actually looking at opening up in a port in the occupied portions of Georgia because the Ukrainians are giving them a very hard time. So the Russian Navy, I think, has been a disappointment to Russia in the Black Sea. The Russian Air Force has been a disappointment to Russia overhead Ukraine. But the Russian Army, through its mass, uh, has been has had some successes on the battlefield. <laughs> Thank you. And regarding Ukraine, where do you see the major weaknesses and strengths of the Ukrainian troops? So, so almost exactly aligned with 
um, with Russia, the Ukrainians really do not have a navy. They have built a very unconventional navy, and they're very good with it. But these are drones, above the sea drones, underwater drones, and air drones that are having great effect on the Russian Navy. And so the ability to truly defend their coastline and to take offensive operations deeply into the Black Sea, I think is something that we in the West want to work with Ukraine to build if and when we can get to peace and start preparing for the next Russian invasion of Ukraine. Secondarily, I believe that the same can be said about the Ukrainian Air Force. The Ukrainian Air Force, small but mighty, they have fought heroically. They have done some very good work with some very old airplanes and old capabilities and Russian capabilities. They have done some good work. But to get to the point where they can establish and hold uh, battlefield air superiority over their troops so that their troops can do modern maneuver warfare, they're unable to do that right now. And we are just beginning that program. We are, we are 18 to two years, 18 months to two years late in beginning to build them an air capability. And now that air capability will be delayed into next year. The general public is always concerned about the use of nuclear weapons in the Ukraine war by, by Russia. Do you see that as a realistic uh, possibility or not really? So um, I'm going to speak out both sides of my mouth. Um, I think we have to acad academically understand and, and accept that Russia using nuclear weapons could happen. I believe that the the possibility of Russia using new nuclear weapons diminishes now over time. I don't, there are many people who agree with me and others that, that uh, uh, Putin's ability to absolutely direct something to happen has diminished. Uh, I belong to the group of people that do not believe that, Ru that Mr. Putin has the hold over his military establishment that he had two years ago. And we saw that in the insurrection uh, of the, of the um, forces uh, that, that rose in the South and, and the Wagner group and others that rose in the South. And the fact that many of his Russian commanders did not stop Wagner early in this thing. I think that the the absolute iron fist that Mr. Putin has over his forces is not what it used to be. I also believe that there are forces out there, uh, among them possibly the Chinese, who uh, are urging Mr. Putin to, to calm the rhetoric over nukes. They don't want nukes popping off. China owns the longest border with Russia of anyone. And I mm -hmm. think there are forces out there that that would ask them to reconsider. So I've spoken out both sides of my mouth. We have to be academically honest. Russia could resort to nukes, but I personally believe that the possibility of that has diminished and will continue to diminish into the future. Talking about Putin, uh, at the beginning of the war, we got all the impression that Putin was actually directing battlefield strategy. Is that still the case or is the Russian military really deciding where to attack and when to attack and so on? I think anyone that tells you that they know the answer to that question, you should close your phone, turn things off and walk away because I don't know that anyone truly understands that. Here's what we do know. There were decisions made in the beginning of this war that I do not think a general officer in the general and the German general staff would have made. The, the logistical failures at the beginning of this war uh, were, were horrendous. And we don't know who was advising Mr. Putin through those logistical failures. But in the West, in schools, we have this saying, and I will horribly paraphrase it, horribly paraphrase it. But we say that amateurs talk operations 
and professionals talk logistics. And you saw like the buildup before Desert Storm 1, that massive buildup in the desert that we did. And why could we do that? Because we had battlefield air superiority over that buildup and we knew it wasn't going to get attacked. And so uh, Russia made some horrible mistakes in the beginning of this war that are uncharacteristic of military planning staffs. I have no idea. I, I would be guessing alongside you and others if I told you what happened, but I can tell you that there were horrible decisions made and that we have to learn why later. And the decision making at the moment on the part of Russia has improved compared to the beginning of the war? It has to some degree. Um, Russia, I think, now understands that it's not going to be able to establish air superiority. It is not or is incapable of doing what we call modern maneuver warfare. It is doing uh, sort of mass uh, uh, attrition based attacks. Uh, it is uh, less than what I would call um, um, uh, I'm, I'm stumbling on the word. They are not using tactics that might lead to different outcomes. They're using the same tactics on the battlefield. Um, and uh, I don't see a lot changing. And, and oh, by the way, we in the West, uh, went through a period where we were very critical of Ukraine. And uh, you've heard the papers writing these articles about, we taught them how to do maneuver, modern maneuver warfare, and they're not doing it. Hello, they're not doing it because we haven't given them the tools to do it. Western maneuver warfare, the very first thing we establish is battlefield air superiority over the troops so that they can maneuver below that. Have we given Ukraine what it needs to establish battlefield air superiority? No, let me say that one more time. No, we have not given it to them. Okay, so um, may I also say that if you were to go to some of our leaders, like the one I served with, who is now our Secretary of Defense, if you had gone to Lloyd Austin back when he was a commander of CENTCOM and told him he was going to have to fight his fight without his long range precise artillery, his head would have exploded. Okay. We have not, and I'll say that one more time, we have not given Ukraine long range precise artillery. And that is uh, a couple of reasons why they're not fighting modern maneuver warfare the way that we would have liked to have taught them. If you'll give me two seconds, I need to close a, a shade so that bright uh, is gone. Hold on one second. Sure. The sun moves through the day and what you start a session with, you don't always end with. Uh, thank you. The Ukrainians want F-16s, and you have flown F-16s a lot, I understand. What is it like to fly such a plane? Well, first of all, um, I do love the F-16. I flew it for on and off for 24 years. I flew every model of it from the most basics to the all the way through the Block 52, which is the suppression of any, any air defenses version of it. It's a great capability, but but what you if you listen to what I said over and over, I, I usually use the term fourth plus generation aircraft. Um, it didn't have to be the F-16. If it was a fourth generation, fourth plus, meaning it had been upgraded to the current uh, set of avionics and capabilities, um, that's what Ukraine needed. The F-16 is a great answer to that. And the F-16 has been upgraded all through its life such that the, the capabilities of the aircraft and the weapons that it carries are very, very formidable. And it will, it is a truly multi-mission aircraft. This is important for an air force like Ukraine's. In the beginning of the war, a multi-mission aircraft can be focused on establishing air defense, and establishing battlefield air superiority. As battlefield air superiority is won, 
Then the multi-mission aircraft can be re-rolled into ground support, which is the ultimate goal of the Air Force is to enable those ground forces to win on the ground, to set conditions for victory by the ground forces. And then the aircraft can once again then go into an air defense role once a victory is won over the land to hold the land and not allow the enemy to come back and retake it. So a truly very capable multi-mission aircraft is something that will be very valuable for the Ukrainian air forces into the future. And we are just beginning that journey. We should have begun this journey two years ago or five years ago or six years ago after the first invasion of Ukraine. But uh, for reasons that all can understand, we made choices not to do that. So your prediction is that the war in Ukraine will go on for quite some time, a very long time. What would you predict? I don't predict that. I, I would tell you that, again, I go back to my original construct. This war will end exactly how Western policymakers want it to end. And it will end essentially when Western policymakers want it to end. If Western policymakers make a decision to slow down or eliminate support, it will end fairly quickly in the favor of Russia. If Western policymakers continue the level of support, which we're doing now, this war will take some time, but it will end and most likely in the favor of Russia. Of Ukraine. If, if uh, uh, no, of Russia. Right. If we don't change what we're doing now, this war will end in favor of Russia. Okay. The third option is if Western policymakers make a decision to give Ukraine what it needs to win, then it can win. And how we do that and how rapidly we will do that would affect how long it would take. Let me just give you a picture. I've already sort of led you down the path a little bit. I'm asked all the time, well, what does it take for Ukraine to win? My opening answer is give Ukraine what we would take to the battlefield if we were fighting this. Uh, a simple question, which I can't ask to your audience, but I'm going to ask it and then answer it is, when was the last time that an American soldier, sailor, airman, or Marine died to the fixed wing attack of an enemy? It was spring of 1953 in the Korean War. We have given American forces and coalition forces around us battlefield air superiority ever since that day. Now, in Desert One, we lost some soldiers, as you know, to scuds. Uh, and then we had to figure that out. But fixed wing attack, aircraft attack of our ground forces, it's spring of 1953. And so the starting thing that we need to give Ukraine is the ability to have battlefield air superiority over their troops. We have not, I already said this once, twice, we have not given them that. We would take long-range, precise artillery to the war. We have not given that to Ukraine. After nearly 20 months of, of, of absolutely beating people up in the press, saying we need to give them uh, attackums, we gave them a very few. We gave them our oldest ones, our shortest range ones, and with the least capable warhead on it. What we need to do is give Ukraine the kind of attackums that we would take to war if we were running the war there. So I would just open with what we need to give Ukraine are all of those things that we would take to the battlefield to protect our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, and to enable our troops to win the conflict. Thank you. A very clear statement. Let's turn, if I may, to the war in Israel, Gaza. What, in your view, is the military situation there right now? Well, uh, OK, so it's kind of hard to to describe, but we had a uh, as just to recoup, we had a 
had an incredibly horrendous uh, attack by terrorist forces into Israel. And the results of that everyone sees and knows, and it's horrendous. And the bloodshed there was targeted. It was intentional, intentional, and it was aimed primarily at civilians. Um, Israel has reacted, as you know, and Israel is carrying out an operation that is uh, primarily, uh, I think completely, but it is aimed at the terrorist forces inside of uh, Gaza uh, and a few strikes into other places like the West Bank. But the bottom line is uh, Hamas is the target. Hamas is Iran, Iran is Hamas, Hamas is Iran, Iran is Hamas. And so Israel is targeting Iran and Hamas in the Gaza Strip. And um, it is a messy business. Uh, there is no doubt about it that civilians and innocent civilians are being lost. Uh, but I would tell you without a shadow of a doubt that when Hamas went into Israel, they intended to kill civilians. They were their targets. And the horrendous way they did it was at their behest and in their plan. I do not believe that uh, Israel intends to cause inappropriate loss of civilians, but they also know, just as we know, you cannot do this kind of urban warfare without loss of civilians. And so it's horrible that we have civilians being lost. There is a difference in my mind between Palestinians and Hamas. I feel for and hope for Palestinians. Uh, I feel and hope that the uh, Israelis will have success in eliminating the terrorist, uh, the Iranian Hamas. And so right, right now we have a tough, tough situation. Is that possible? Do you think Hamas can be eradicated by urban warfare, by going into the tunnels and so on? No. But one of the rules, I'm not a Middle Eastern expert. I'm really a European guy, but I have flown with the Israeli Air Forces many times, and I've, I've been a part of helping them develop their command and control systems down there. And um, what, what people say all over the Middle East is when you use force, to eliminate um, um, terrorists. For every terrorist you kill, you create at a minimum one more terrorist. In some cases, it may be multiplicative. You may create more than one. So we all know, and I think ac actually um, Israelis know this as well. When you kill Hamas, you are creating the next Hamas. Uh, but here's what I also know. Uh, the Israeli people, and there are some that disagree, but the numbers are pretty small. The Israeli people are pushing their government to eliminate Hamas. Uh, and so the Israeli government has some pretty tough decisions made to make based on what the polling in their public is saying. In my opinion, I, again, I am not a Middle East expert. Are the Israelis doing enough to protect civilians? I'm not a military expert. You are. Is the fighting taking, you know, enough protection uh, regarding civilians than the Israelis could? Or are they, because of their uh, uh, being furious about the Hamas attack, they uh, use perhaps more violence, more force than is absolutely necessary? So I would turn your question around at first to set the whole question and say, is Hamas doing enough to not involve the civilians? Fair and enough. the answer is a distinct no, because Hamas is surrounding themselves with civilians, which is a war crime to use civilians as a shield or to surround themselves. So the first question that needs to be asked in this conversation is, does Hamas regard the lives of Palestinians? And the answer is no. The answer is absolutely not. They surround themselves with the civilians so that there are high civilian losses in this. Now, to the second question, um, 
I think if I answered it, I would be guessing because I have not been there to watch and see the way that the Israelis are conducting this war. Um, if you listen to the press, it's one story. If you listen to the Israeli story, uh, soldiers, it's another story. I think this is a place history is going to judge um, whether they're doing enough or not. But I do know that the first answer is 100% easy to know, and that is Hamas is not doing what it should to protect Palestinians. Rather, it is causing Palestinian death. I think we all agree with that. Uh, but the question is, of course, that shouldn't be uh, keep Israel at a much higher standard than a terror organization like Hamas. You know, our our expectations of Hamas are very, very low. You don't really expect any care for civilians from Hamas. But it is different with Israel, a Western-style democracy, who also uh, observes human rights and so on. Yeah, I don't argue with you on that. Yeah. So it's a dilemma, I fully understand. And... Um, we have we are close to a hostage deal i i hear and perhaps uh, there will be some sort of uh, ceasefire soon and an exchange of uh, hostages perhaps you know something major is happening in a positive way we don't know yet uh, general breedlov thank you very much for answering my questions let's turn to the audience and have a few questions from the audience and I would like Emma and Jerry to switch on and perhaps turn to Emma. Emma, uh, do we have a question? And uh, can you read it aloud to us, please? Yes, I'm going to go back to the Ukraine discussion. Jennifer asked, you discussed Ukrainian attrition. What happens when Ukraine can no longer supply forces to fight the fight? Do we see this as a possibility? Well, uh, uh, Jennifer, I think you said was her name. I. Um, it's a very good question, and I didn't, I sort of answered it, but I didn't answer it well. And that is a long term fight favors Russia because Russia has a greater depth of not only people, but equipment. Now, most of the Russian very good equipment has been destroyed. What they can bring to the fight now is decidedly less capable. But the fact of the matter is that a long term fight favors Russia for exactly what Jennifer is asking. And that is because uh, Ukraine will run out of manpower and woman power before Russia does. Thank you. Jerry, can you ask the next question, please? We have a question from Randall Stone. Uh, how decisive is the introduction of F-16 and will it allow Ukraine to control the Black Sea and establish air superiority over the battlefield in the East and Southeast? And how many F-16 will be required to make a decisive impact? Wow, that is a big question, uh, Randall. So um, it's not going to be decisive in the near end because the numbers will be small and they will build up over time. And the experience of the Ukrainian pilots will be limited and it will build up over time. Um, uh, an F-16 uh Air Force big enough to make an immediate impact is not going to happen this year and may not even happen next year. Um, it is going to take some time to get to that. And um, we want the, the Ukrainian Air Force to succeed. So if we ask them to do too much too soon, they might not succeed. And that would be a horrible signal to the world, et cetera. And so I hope and I believe, knowing the people that are there uh, who, who I have served with, that we will be advising them and helping them think their way through how to use this weapon in the short term in an effective way. But just like there are a lot of people who incorrectly still believe that the counteroffensive should be the charge of the light brigade with rapiers and flags in the sky, Neither should we expect a handful of F-16s to change this battlefield. It will take some time. 
Let, let me follow up on that. Is there anything the US can provide which, uh, or the Europeans can provide which the US cannot provide? Is there a sort of division of um, uh, arms deliveries uh, 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 happening right now? So it's a magnificent question, and I was going to go there even before you asked it, but thank you. The bottom line is battlefield air superiority is not about just airplanes. It's a combination of airplanes. It's a combination of surface to air missiles. And even as more important than some of that is a combination of sensors, which gives Ukraine a very good view of the battlefield and what's going on. So they know where to use their limited capabilities. Airplanes go up and come down. Surface to air missiles, if they're well managed, stay up 24 hours. And I must tell you that one of the great successes of this war, it was more prevalent in the beginning of the war, but it is now, is that the Russians have been kept from establishing battlefield air superiority by a very smart, small, but talented uh, group of surface air missiles that the Ukrainians learned to move around so that the Russians couldn't destroy them. Thank you. Uh, Emma, uh, the next question, please. We have a question alluding to geopolitical consequences by Stuart Kaplan. He asks, is it reasonable to assume that the level of support provided to Ukraine would be an indication to Xi Jinping of the level of support offered to Taiwan by the U.S. in the event that the PRC attempts to invade that island? Absolutely. Completely and violently agree. I'm asked all the time, what is our policy towards Taiwan? And I tell people all the time that our policy towards Taiwan is being written in Ukraine right now. The whole world, Iran, North Korea, China, are watching and is watching what the United States and other nations are doing in Ukraine. And our credibility, which is a huge part of deterrence, our credibility and our policy is being written in Ukraine right now. I heard two extremely smart uh, people today on China. I will not call their name out because of the meeting I was in. But what both of them said was that um, the most important thing we could give Taiwan right now is a victory in Ukraine. Let me go back in history uh, uh, regarding American credibility. It was said that American credibility was so vulnerable that a loss in Vietnam would really destroy American credibility. But within a few years of the, the defeat and loss of Vietnam, that credibility didn't seem to be affected all that much. Throughout the rest of the Cold War, the United States was as strong as ever. So is now our concern about American credibility in Ukraine really justified or are we exaggerating it? No, no, I believe it is justified. You're exactly correct. As you know, American credibility changes with the leadership in America. During the Reagan years, we had great credibility. Uh, during other years, we don't. And so the, the world watches how America governs and how America leads. And our credibility is, I think, episodic based on those things. And I don't, I'm not making a political statement here because we've had great leaders on both sides of the aisle and we've had some less than great leaders on both sides of the aisle. But I do believe that, Amer you know, deterrence is about kit and capabilities. It's about credibility and it's about intent. And we can do a lot in an industrial way about the kit and capabilities, but the credibility and the intent is going to be, I hate to say it, it's almost situational ethics, if you remember that term that people use about. Our, uh, our um, stability in the past for our credibility has truly been in the Congress um, and so um, we have some modicum of stability, but the bottom line is, I do believe that, as you might agree, there are ebb and flows in the deterrent value of what the West can do based on leadership in the West. 
A part of American credibility is working closely together with allies, I believe. And at the moment, this seems to be working almost ideally well. Not that they all provide the support, as you rightly pointed out, which may be necessary, but they are not disagreeing. They are cooperating closely. So shouldn't American credibility be quite high right now? Well, uh, I would say that we... um... Your, your pre- premise is exactly right, that having strong alliances and allies of like mind is very important. But I think that history may look back at our current set of allies, which are working well together, and judge them all harshly for uh, not having the determination to truly stop Russia. Again, in 2008, I would offer that our response was inadequate to task, and we rewarded bad behavior. In 2014, our response was inadequate to task, and we rewarded bad behavior. And we are now discussing that maybe the way forward is that Ukraine give up more, more Ukrainian land for our safety. And that personal pronoun is important, as I I hope you caught. And so uh, the question that you posed, I think, is right and just. We are doing well in coordinating with our uh, allies. The question we have to ask ourselves is, are we writing a story of credibility that will stand the test of time? Remembering that many believe we are writing our policy right now for Taiwan in Ukraine. Are there any other lessons the Chinese are taking from the Ukraine war? For example, that Russia's uh, apparent easy success in Ukraine proved not to be uh, the case. So wouldn't the Chinese also have second thoughts about invading Taiwan if they ever wanted to do it in the first place? And of course, we really don't know if that ever was the intention. I do believe you are exactly right. I think that China has looked closely at what the invading army of Russia suffered and how hard it was to do. And oh, by the way, it's going to be harder if you have to go across an ocean or at least a large body of water and do an amphibious attack. And I do believe that China's probably learning a lot and thinking a lot by watching the failures of the Russian military. Thank you. Uh, Jerry, would you ask the next question, please? <laughs> I have a question from Dave Sidor. Does the U.S. need to significantly expand its military production, particularly artillery and its ammunition? And are we seriously drawing down our military supply due to aid to Ukraine and Israel? So, Dave, this is the question that I spent almost an hour talking with very important people about today. And that is uh, the challenges that our military industrial complex face. Now, We might try to sit back and judge the military industrial complex when, in fact, it is really our own laws and regulations which have changed the military industrial complex. And and we have to be honest here. Some bad actions by some bad people created laws and regulations to make sure that people weren't abusing the systems of the past. And so um, because of some corruption and things that happen in our history, we have created laws which very closely control the industrial complex as it builds things. And it is against the law to use money. If we give money to a company to build 100 widgets and they use a bunch of that money to create more capacity so that they might make some extra money selling widgets to someone else or whatever, that's against the law. So to say it simply, we disincentivize excess capacity. In this war, in the beginning of the war, one of the missiles that we use a lot, and we gave a lot to Ukraine, and they were highly successful, uh, we went to industry and said, double your capacity. Industry went away for about two weeks, did all of their gonculating and came back and said, outstanding first deliveries, middle of uh, 2026. And why is that? 
why would it take three plus years to double capacity? Well, most of the industries would have to build an entire new line because they only have a line built for the capacity that they're being paid for as the law states. Most of the industries do not have extra bench stock. They create the parts and the spare parts at the rate that they're being paid for and controlled by the system. And so um, to not to overstate, but we in America have to look at uh, a different way to incentivize the defense industrial base to create excess capacities. We would have to change our laws and regulations to do that because anything you do to change the speed and capability of building parts costs money. And right now that money is controlled and clamped off in a way that does not, does not incentivize excess capacity. So this is not a bad thing by our government. The government took care of a problem that, that we had in our country. They absolutely took care of it. But the answer to that problem is created uh, a system whereby uh, we don't have excess capacity. And that is exacerbated by a 20 year or so peace dividend when the wall went down. And so these cataclysmic forces begin to work together to find us in a place where we don't have the capacity we need. Uh, right now, we are using up things that we might need in the future, but we have not dug very deeply into that at all. The The 155 rounds that we gave Ukraine came from a stock that we were never going to use, the DPICM, which are the bomblet rounds. We, we're not going to use those. There's only one place in the world that we use those, and that's a, diff a different war that, that we have plenty for. It's the same thing with the current ATACMs. We, we pushed and pushed and pushed our government to give Ukraine the ATACMs. They gave Ukraine ATACMs that we were never going to use. The short range, um, uh, less capable warhead ATACMs. And so we haven't really started to dig into some of the most critical um, things that, that we have now. We're beginning to get there in things like surface-to-air missile capabilities. We were talking earlier about we have not given Ukraine what it needs to um, establish battlefield air superiority. Doing that might put us in a real challenging situation because we don't have many THADs. I think the number is classified, but it's not bigger than two handfuls, and we just can't throw THADs around the world. Patriots... The older Patriot missiles, we have some of those that are available, but, but the new, more capable missiles that can shoot down the highly capable cruise missiles and things, we don't have a huge supply of those. So um, there are some challenges there, no doubt let, about it. Let me ask a, perhaps a naive question. At the beginning of the Second World War, the British, the, the Americans, of course, many other countries seemed to turn around their factories very, very quickly into war-producing factories. Now that doesn't seem to be possible. Uh, is the Western world less capable or is it a matter of will? I don't think it's either. I think weapons are so much more sophisticated now. If all you have to do is build a unitary M115 round, You would think that was easy, but we have created five different barrels that shoot the 115, and the two can't be mixed. A, a barrel from this country and this company can't shoot the 155 round from this company and that country. And so we've created some of our own problems. But the bottom line is, um, for instance, this example I gave you where the, the company couldn't uh, double production in, in less than three years. Part of the problems is not the big company. They actually could get their line done and so forth. But when you look at the weapon, the little laser range ring finder that does the INS stabilization is built by a little mom and pop operation, okay, in this state over there. And those guys don't have a second line. They don't have trained people that they can add quickly. And it just takes them a while to catch up. So now that we have these very sophisticated weapons, it is harder for the industry to react at speed. I believe, actually, um, uh, Klaus, that 
if we put our economy on a war footing, it would be different. But we are not on a war footing, and neither is our industry. Thank you. Emma, would you ask the next question, please? Yes, excuse my pronunciation, but Primislav Fergas asks, should Pol Poland intervene militarily in defense of Ukraine when Ukrainians, exhausted by the prolonged war, start to clearly and unequivocally lose the war and Russian army starts to gain ground? Wow, I am, uh, uh, Primislav, I really love your question and I love what I can read in your question, but it would be absolutely absurd for me to... Uh, to, to advise uh, Warsaw how to fight that problem. I, I learned when I was the SACUR that uh, the last thing I needed to do was to reach into independent sovereign nations and tell them what to do. Rather, I tried to lead them to uh, a, a joint solution to issues like this. Uh, I think the basic question that you're asking though, has a way forward. You know, in NATO, everyone talks about Article 5. Very few people talk about Article 3 and Article 4. Article 3 basically says that you should provide for your own defense and create excess capacity to provide to your allies' defense. And so I shortened that when I was the SACUR and said, Defense starts at home, okay? So we need to create capacities at home to defend the home and then excess for the nation. But the but Article 4, I think, applies to your question. Very few talk about Article 4. And Article 4 allows any nation, like in your situation, Poland, to go to the, the NAC, the North Atlantic Council, and ask for an Article 4 consultation which would be to bring up the situation and say, uh, we are fearful of what's happening in Ukraine. We believe that a Russian defeat of Ukraine then puts our border at risk, as well as the Baltic states' borders, as well as Romania's borders, as uh, you know, and Bulgaria's borders. And we are asking for an Article Four consultation, <clears throat> and then the entire NATO comes together to decide. Is this now something that we need to address? So, so uh, premise law, I would just offer that rather than me telling Poland what they need to do, I think as you describe this uh, question, it would be the perfect premise for Poland to call for an Article 4 consultation of the North Atlantic Council, and that brings the right minds and the capabilities to the decision-making process. Thank you. Do you think that in the end, if that continues for much longer, NATO, the NATO alliance will be dragged into the war in Ukraine, perhaps via Article 5? Well, I, I think the question that you're basically asking is, is Mr. Putin stupid enough to attack across a NATO border? <laughs> if Mr. Putin is stupid enough to attack across a NATO border, then we will probably have an Article 5 response. I don't like the term, and I'm I'm not being angry with you, sir. You're you're an obviously a very intelligent guy. I I don't like that being dragged into an Article Five response. Do you you know that the only time Article Five has been invoked was when the NATO nations invoked Article Five for the attack on America? Okay, so the only time we've been quote unquote dragged into a conflict is when everyone came to America's aid. I rather go back to uh, the discussion just a minute ago, you know, an Article Four consultation that would happen, or the reaction of the NATO response forces if Mr. Putin was stupid enough to go across a border. I don't describe that as being dragged in. That is the nations doing exactly what they did for America, and America would do with the, exactly that for a nation that was invaded by. Mr. Putin. So do you expect Putin to be stupid enough in the future? I don't. Actually, he hasn't yet, has he? You know, I do believe that right now we have a kinetic war going on in Ukraine. And if you're paying attention, there is a hybrid war going on in Moldova. 
and talk to the Moldovan people about the depth of the Russian attacks across the spectrum in Moldova. And we see a hybrid war primarily of illicit money and all those things going on in Georgia. So I see Mr. Putin acting just like he told us he would in those two documents that he wanted us to sign. I see him acting in non-NATO nations, but I also see him being very careful right now. Now, may I just say, you are aware and I'm aware that they're shooting rockets and rounds into that little tiny part of Ukraine that's down uh, on the Romanian border in the in the delta uh, of the river. And so uh, they are flirting with disaster down there. Mm -hmm. I think they're measuring our response to their shooting into a portion of Ukraine that is very close to a NATO border. Mm -hmm. um, Jerry, would you ask the next question? I have a question from Professor Song Yong Li about NATO deployment in Eastern Europe. After the signing of armistice in 1953, American forces in Korean Peninsula has largely deterred the reopening of war. Could the reinforcement and deployment of NATO forces, say in Poland, inspire Putin to rethink his plan, or would that backfire? So we already have a pretty good reinforcement of both U.S. and NATO forces in Poland, as well as the three Baltic nations and Romania. So I do believe those are already having a good deterrent effect back to the previous question that I, I had with Klaus. And that is, I think that Mr. Putin does understand what a NATO border is. And I believe that the actions that we began when I was the SACUR of putting those forces forward, NATO forces forward and U.S. forces forward into the border nations, I believe those have had effect. Now, we had small forces there. We still have small-ish small forces there, but they're way bigger and way more than when I was the SACUR. Now we're we're up to battalion size and brigade size elements with core headquarters uh, in some of these nations. And I think that these do have a deterrent value. I also believe that Mr. Putin is very aware of how poorly his Air Force has performed. And we have pushed a lot of Air, air Force and I should say Air Power because it's Air Force, Navy, Marine and Army air capabilities. We have pushed an awful lot of that into the Ford area. And I think Mr. Putin understands that it would be a little different if he went across those borders. Emma. Yes, yeah, so you've discussed directly um, potential outcomes in the event of a Ukrainian setback or continuing to the status quo. But Brian Kalef asks, can Putin survive a Ukraine setback or even worse, a loss of Crimea? No, I don't believe he can. That's part of the problem. Um, um, and that's why some in the West have taken counsel of their fears and they do not know how to deal with the possibility of Mr. Putin being uh, defeated or Russia being defeated. I, again, we have to be academically honest and understand that this, there is no zero risk way ahead. If we defeat Mr. Putin, there is risk. If we continue to back up every time Mr. Putin threatens with nukes or a wider war, we will back ourselves right up to a NATO border and then we've got a real problem. And so um, uh, there is no zero risk way ahead. And we simply have to make a policy decision and then uh, make sure that we are in a, agreement with our allies and move out. Are you aware of any contingency planning which is taking place in the military, in the political realm, about the future of Russia? If, if Putin uh, uh, collapses, if Russia collapses, if the, the country disintegrates, any other scenario, are these contingency plannings uh, are taking place? So, so this is a broad question, and I will give you a small part of a broad answer. 
I am, uh, I refrain, even though I have all of my security clearances, I refrain from discussing these matters with my government because then I can't have these conversations with you. So I can give you no insight into what our government is doing. But I will tell you that having been the secure, I know that this is what we do. We plan, we do contingency planning. So I have every expectation that these things are being talked about. And then there are big groups and think tanks, and I'm actually on a team that is commissioned by one of our DOD elements that is looking at some of these things, but it is an entirely civilian group and it is being done at an un unclassified level. So I would just tell you that I am nearly positive that there are multiple levels of planning being done for how and what might happen, but I cannot tell you definitively what those are. The same would apply, of course, if Zelensky was going to fall or if there was some political upheaval in Ukraine. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you, uh, Jerry. Can we uh, have the next question? We have a set of questions from Jennifer and Stuart on the, the situation in Israel and Gaza. Uh, should the administration do more to support Palestinian civilians? And what is the best solution for Israel to save the hostages uh, taken by Hamas? Okay, I, I must tell you, I am wholly unqualified to answer either of these questions. I will give you my personal opinion, okay? But I, as I explained earlier, I am not a Middle East expert. I have flown in multiple large ac exercises with the Israeli Air Force, and I have been a part of helping to establish the command and control of their air defenses. These were jobs I had in my past, and I have those experiences. Beyond that, I'm a European expert, not an Israeli expert. I would tell you that um, Israel, I believe, is in a very tough place. You have leadership that wants to do the right thing, and I'm not defining what the right thing is. They are trying to do what they believe their populace does. You have some leadership uh, that is very takes a little more hardline approach. You have some leadership that takes a little softer approach. We know both of those leaders. We understand where they come from. We understand how they react to their people. And right now they have formed a unity government and they're trying to move forward, not divided, but together to address the what the Israeli people want. Um, and um, the question you asked or they're asking are very similar to what was asked to me before by Klaus and that is, um, I, I, uh, I simply always remind that the first question should be, what is the responsibility of the protagonist, the end or the antagonist, excuse me, in this issue? And that is the terrorist organization Hamas. What is their requirement and responsibility to the Palestinian people? And I think that they have demonstrated in this war already that they could care less about the Palestinian people. The Palestinian people are a tool by which they get the world to take effect on Israel. And I believe the question then is, how does Israel work the cal calculus? Because they know this, they understand this, and how do they come to the calculus that decides ceasefire versus no ceasefire, more attacks versus less attacks, um, knowing, absolutely knowing that there are miles of tunnels under the schools, hospitals, et cetera, of, of Gaza, what is the value then of taking down that uh, network versus what it costs them in world opinion? These are all judgments I can't make, um, and I believe the Israelis are uh, taking I do not believe that the leadership of Israel is acting out of rage. I do believe some of the people of Israel are still uh, filled with this rage because of the horrific attacks that were made on them. So uh, I don't have any answers and I am so sorry. Uh, 
Thank you. Have you ever in your long military career had to deal with uh, these underground fortifications, tunnels, both the establishment and perhaps the destruction of tunnels? It is still puzzling to me that Hamas should have been able to build up this huge network of tunnels throughout many years without Israel either noticing or tolerating it. No, I think they have noticed. I uh, one of my last trips to Israel, I got to go down in a in a tunnel that they found and they kept it off, and we went down and looked in it and and went pretty far in the tunnel, almost into well, Gaza. How big, how big was the tunnel? Oh, it was maybe uh, two people's arms width, and about a foot above my head as a six foot one person, six foot two person. So it was a pretty big tunnel, but it was not one of their biggest tunnels. It was an attack tunnel in the South. It was made for getting people under the fences and all of the defenses and free into the Israeli um, side. So I, I think that Israel is aware of much of it but they're not aware of all of it because some of these are so deep that you cannot pick them up by seismic action. Except so why did they not interrupt the building of the tunnels while they were being built? Uh, because they probably could imagine what they might be used for in the end. Yeah. Uh, I think this is a question that we'll have to look at. Was there a failure of intelligence? Was there, was there understanding? But how to take action when something's being built in the middle of another sovereign area. I, I don't know. Again, uh, I, I'm not well prepared to talk to these subjects. It's not my area of expertise. Thank you. We have a few minutes left before we need to complete our session for today. Perhaps we'll take a couple of more questions. Emma, would you ask the next question? Yes. So Stefan Engel asks, what, if any, connections exist between the conflicts in Ukraine and Gaza? In other words, did Putin somehow pull strings through Iran and Hamas to start that conflict to deflect the interest away from Ukraine? So Stefan, it's a great answer. And there are a lot of conspiracy theorists out there, um, you know, and, and that the attack happened on Mr. Putin's birthday is kind of interesting, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I do believe, I do believe that Iran, China, and, and Russia understand that bringing pressure on multiple fronts against the United States is a problem for the United States. We saw these missile attacks coming out of the Middle East that were shot down by ships. We saw um, uh, pressure by Russia and Ukraine, the whole attack in Avdika has been pressuring the West at the same time that Israel is, un, is pressuring uh, Hamas. Um, there is a lot of um, simultaneity that is hard to explain, but I will not join the conspiracy theorist and until I have better indications of what what and if there was collusion, I, I'm not going to add uh, to this. I will, I will form an opinion on this because I said this is my part of the world and I, I need to understand it. But right now, I think we're all in the unclassified sense. The classified people may have more, but for those of us who are looking at the manifestations of what's going on on the ground in an external unclassified way, I do not believe that we can draw those kinds of conclusions just yet. In your uh, view, we have a major crisis in Ukraine, a major crisis in the Middle East. If there were another major crisis in the Indo-Pacific, would the United States be strong enough to deal with it? I think that the United States may have to make a decision at that point about what we are doing uh, in America. As you and I talked about earlier, we are not on a war footing in our economy right now. We have not started those war footing type of activities in our military industrial complex. And if we are going to have that broad of a problem, then our senior most leaders are going to have to set the nation for success. And we haven't taken those kinds of decisions yet. But it would be possible, you believe? I do. I absolutely do. Think about what we did for World War II. 
I mean, so here's a here's a factoid that is not well understood out there. In Ukraine today, for a little over 3% of DOD's one-year annual budget, Ukraine has reduced Russian forces conservatively by 42%. Somebody say, some people say 52%. So for 3% of one year's annual budget of DOD, Ukraine has destroyed four of the most important units in Russian military and reduced between 40 and 50% of its combat capability. So we are nowhere near at a point where we are stressed like we were in World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, other places. So, um, but the fact of the matter is that, sir, as you and I discussed earlier, we have not taken the decision in America yet to go to a wartime footing. Thank you very much. Perhaps the last two questions. First, Jerry, and then Emma. Jerry, please. Chris Messel has a, has a follow-up question. How do you assess the progress and development of China's military capabilities? Very good. Very good. So one of the, again, this was a conversation we had today, which was quite interesting. When you have an autocratic, or as I say, a kleptocratic government, it can set certain production timelines, acceleration training timelines, capability timelines, and then it can stay closer to remaining on track. In the West, for all kinds of things that we love, we sometimes change our mind, and from time to time, governments change and priorities change, and we are a less we are less resolute on meeting our plans. Uh, our budgets change every time we have a new uh, government, and so uh, China has set some long term plans, and they are proceeding according to those plans. But I tell people all the time, you know, China can copy. Western kit. One of their airplanes, one of their airplanes is within a millimeter all around the front of it of one of our airplanes. We know where they got the plans to that airplane. You know, they haven't figured out how to do the stealth coatings and things, but they're shaping and stuff they have stolen and they're emulating. And so they are building some pretty good things. Um, but may I just ask you a question? Do you have any idea? how long it takes to get 20 years of experience in a fighter pilot? It takes 20 years to get 20 years experience in a fighter pilot. And so you could build kit all you want, but you don't leap forward in experience and capability. And so uh, while we see uh, forces around the world beginning actually to catch up to us in technology, it will be some time. Like I said, Russia has some of the best kit out there, and they have been completely unable to do suppression of enemy air defenses in Ukraine, and therefore they've been unable to establish battlefield super air superiority over their own troops, and that's costing them dearly in this war. And so, um, so I, I absolutely admire what the Chinese are doing and how they're doing it and their discipline at moving forward, their ability to control their economy and how much they're inputting into their military, which none of us know because they hide where they spend money all over the place. Um, you know, I, I think that they are a sight to behold as far as their discipline, but they still have a ways to go to get to the level of capability that, that NATO Air Forces and Israeli Air Forces have out there. The Chinese Navy is now larger than the American Navy. Isn't that correct? Yes, the the type hulls are not well correlated. The, the, the U.S. Navy is still a very much a multi-ocean blue water Navy. And, and China is not that. They are, they are still littoral in much of their application. Thank you. Emma, the last question to you. Hmm? Yes, Stuart Kaplan has a strategy question. He asks, wouldn't a naval blockade against commercial shipping be the simplest means for bringing China to heel rather than an amphibious invasion? And would this potentially cause the US Navy to fire upon naval assets of China to break a blockade? 
Would U.S. citizenry support this? Wow, there's about four or five questions there. I am in violent agreement with Stuart. I think that, but let's remember, I am an airman. I have commanded a lot of joint forces, but I am not a naval strategist. But I and others uh, have do, done a lot of reading and looked at things that we have done and believe that rather than attacking China, we should just blockade them and stop them from being able to use the Straits of Malacca, for instance. If you cut their oil off, then the only oil they get is from Russia, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there are multiple tools that we could use, and the navies of the West are a formidable tool and a formidable capability. And I do believe they could bring great issue to the Chinese uh, economy if, if we were to elect to do that. Are you expecting a, Ch a, Ch a, a, a Chinese American military clash as some of, the, of your military colleagues have uh, recently uh, indicated? Yeah, there are people that are making some pretty bold uh, predictions. Uh, I think that uh, Yogi Berra said that the problem of, about predicting the future is that you can't predict the future. So uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to go there. I do believe I do believe that China has said they're going to develop a capability to at least dominate the South China Sea by a certain date in the future. And I do believe that as China does on so many other things, they do what they say they're going to do. And so if they try to hold the South China Sea at risk and cut off Western commerce, I believe they will come in contact with Western capability. Thank you very much, General Britlove. It has been a great uh, pleasure. And thank you for uh, answering all our many questions. Is there a question which we haven't asked, but you, which you want to be asked? Then let me know. No, you got the best one. My whole conversation about, I really believe, as do many now, really believe that the end of the Ukraine war is in the hands of Western policymakers. Western policymakers either have to decide that Ukraine will fail or Ukraine will have to give away more Ukraine to find peace, or West, the Western leaders have to decide that we need to do more to allow Ukraine to win. I think that's the pivotal point. And, and blaming Ukraine or blaming Russia, I, I, I don't find any purchase in that. I believe that Western policy leaders will decide when and how this war ends. And you should be voting for the policy leader that you think has it right. Thank you very much for your clear statement. It has been a most enlightening conversation. And thank you very much for finding the time and really answering all our many questions. We really have peppered you with a lot of questions. I would like to thank our audience for staying with us, for following us. And I would like to thank Jerry and Emma, of course, for helping us out today. And I would like to say good night to everyone. And hopefully the next Crusto Global event will come uh, soon in the new year probably and until then good night and have a good thanksgiving bye bye good night bye, -bye.